On the other hand, we also have this ventral premotor cortex um, and um, it's located, so you can see, much lower down compared to the dorsal premotor cortex. Um, and in, uh, in monkeys, you call it F4 and F5. Um, and the interesting thing about the, uh, the ventral premotor cortex is that it's in intimately linked also to parietal regions, so it's very much involved in coding uh, the visual inputs that you get, for instance, when you have to grasp for a certain object uh, and you have to make a precise uh, control of how you locate the fingers uh, in order to grasp a certain object. So, for instance, if you want to grasp a pen or you want to grasp a ball, you have to make different um, configurations on how you actually handle the, the object. And you will see that the ventral premotor cortex is very much involved in doing the coding of these visually guided um, movements towards certain goals where you have to make very precise um, grips of, of the movements. Um, another fe feature of the ventral premotor cortex is that there are these, um, and so sorry for the slide, I will make it slightly different when I upload it is that, um, that it has these mirror neurons uh, which have been found. So the idea about these mirror neurons is that uh, if you perform a grasping movement, for instance, if you ask a monkey to perform a grasping movement, you will see that there are regions of the ventral premotor cortex that fire when they perform the grasping movements. Interestingly enough, if you then record from the same neurons, you will see that some of them also respond when the monkey just watches an experimenter or another monkey grasp for the same object. And this is the, the reason why these neurons have been called mirror neurons, is that they, they are active both when the monkeys do a task themselves and also when the monkey watches someone else do the task. And um, it has to be pretty, pretty precise the way that if you recall from these neurons, so it has to be so very much the same type of grasping movement that, uh, that the monkey observes. So if, for instance, the experimenter uses some kind of tool to make the same grasping movement, well, then these neur mirror neurons will not um, fire any longer. And for instance, if you uh, hide the object that, uh, that, that uh, the experimenter is grasping, you will see that if the monkey knows that the object is, is still there, but it's just been hidden, so it cannot see the actual object that it's grasping, but it can see that the experimenter is grasping towards something and it knows that behind this screen there is this object that it, um, that it also self have, have grasped it, uh, for, you will see that these mirror neurons also fire. So it's not only like the, the exact impression of what it sees that, that, it's, um, that is coded there, but, but it has to be the same way it grasps. So if, if it takes the, the tool and grasp it behind this, well, then, then these mirror neurons will not fire. But even though it's hidden and he grasps the, the experiments and grasps uh, the object in the same way as the monkey did, well then these mirror neurons will fire. So they're quite sophisticated neurons. Um, recent research have actually also identified that some of these neurons, they are also located in the primary motor cortex. So even though I in the beginning said that these primary motor cortices, they, they code the direction of movements and that sort of what they do, but there seem to be a lot of more sophisticated functions also going on in the primary motor cortex, but it's only a very few number of neurons that, that are able to do so. The supplementary motor area, so that's uh, located more on the medial wall here, so this is a sagittal image of the brain, and you can see in here you have the supplementary motor area and the pre-supplementary motor area. And um, the pre-supplementary motor area is considered, so that's the most anterior part of the supplementary motor areas. So the pre-supplementary motor areas is involved in very cognitive uh, 
demanding uh, motor functions. So for instance, co when there is a certain type of motivation involved in doing a, mo a movement, you will see that the pre-supplementary motor area is also involved in coding why you should actually perform this, this movement. And also if you, for instance, have to, there is a response conflict if you, um, if you present uh, visual stimuli and you have to respond to uh, the visual stimuli and sometimes you make a visual stimuli that you have to react to but they are maybe located in another uh, part of the visual field so uh, you can make these very easy transformations so you present whenever you see for instance a red dot you have to press with the right uh, finger, finger and uh, whenever you see a, a blue dot you have to present with, with the um, the left finger and uh, if you then present these objects so that there is this uh, blue thing presented then in the left part of the visual field and the red thing is presented in the right part of the visual field it's quite an easy task but you will see then that if you um, then switch the locations there is some conflict that you need to um, to solve and you will see that the pre-supplementary motor areas are involved in solving these conflicts when stimuli they are uh, presented in, in new ways that you don't expect them to be. <coughs> um, supplementary motor area is also, it's, it's more related to actually uh, uh, coding these more sequence types of movements. So if we look at the same data as before, you will actually see uh, if we had this uh, visually cued movement from the beginning that where the monkey had to learn a sequence, then you will see that in the beginning you have the involvement of the pre dorsal premotor areas and after the monkeys then have learned to make the sequence of movements you will see that now it's the supplementary motor area that codes just right before they, they perform the movements. So different ways of, of being involved in a motor sequence learning task. Um, another feature of the supplementary motor area is that you will see it involved when um, you imagine performing movements. So uh, if in this case uh, subject has been asked to um, either perform movements or imagine that they perform a movement. And what you will see is that uh, in this case it's, it's measured with the functional magnetic resonance imaging. You will see that the signal, uh, so in, in when you do functional magnetic resonance imaging you this time zero uh, perform the movement. And then because it's a vascular uh, response uh, that you look, so it's, it's not directly neural activity. You see with functional magnetic resonance imaging, it's a correlated measure related to blood flow. Uh, you will see that uh, some around five seconds later, the activity will peak. And uh, in the supplementary motor area, it peaks uh, both when you imagine performing a movement and when you execute a movement, whereas in the primary motor cortex, you will only see that the activity um, increases when you actually perform the movement. So, uh, so there is a dissociation here between the function of the supplementary motor area and the primary motor area when you just imagine performing movements. So, um, so that's also, it's, it's coding how you would actually try and, and, and make these movements, but it's not related, the supplementary motor area is not related to actually executing the movement. <coughs> 